So, you've just p-hacked your way to fame, and you're feeling on top of the world. But wait, what's that? It's a p-curve that can detect all the shady research practices you engaged in. Oh no! Okay, kidding aside, this is the last video of a series of videos on p-hacking. What it is, and why it's so dangerous for science. I gave a pretty detailed high-level explanation of p-hacking in the first video in the series, so if you're not familiar with the idea, please have a look there first. I'll put a link to that below. But in a few seconds, researchers are motivated to get what's called a p-value, to be below a threshold of 0.05. If they do that, their findings are considered meaningful, and they can typically publish their results. If they don't, well, all their work is largely wasted. And to get those p-values below 0.05, there are some very dubious and unethical approaches that they can take. In this video, we'll shift away from how p-hacking works to how to detect it using a tool called a p-curve. Welcome to Data Demystified. I'm Jeff Gallick, and today we'll dig deeper into p-hacking so that you can understand how to spot it when you see research results and avoid it when you do the research yourself. In this video, we're going to build the intuition for how a brilliant p-hacking detection tool called the p-curve works and why it's a powerful tool to thwart this set of bad research practices. Let's jump right in and try to understand the intuition behind the p-curve. It all comes down to what bad researchers are trying to accomplish. Remember, if a statistical result has a p-value above 0.05, then researchers can't easily publish their results. But if it is below 0.05, even by a little bit, they can. What that means is that if people are p-hacking, we'd expect to see an unusually high number of reported statistical tests with p-values just below 0.05. Let me put that a different way. If what researchers are doing is 100% honest, and no one is p-hacking, then we'd expect to find just as many p-values of 0.049 as we would of 0.051. As in that tiny difference is totally meaningless from a scientific standpoint, but it's hugely meaningful from the standpoint of whether researchers can publish or not. If everyone is being honest, and we look across a ton of publications, we should see no differences in the rates of these two types of p-values. But if we see a spike in p-values just under 0.05, that suggests something funky is going on. Well, thanks to a blog post by Yuri Simonson, one of the authors of the original paper that led to a deeper understanding of p-hacking, at least in economics, psychology, and biology, that evidence exists. Though as a quick aside, in that blog post, Yuri goes on to explain that these are actually underestimates of how bad the problem is, but I'll let you read that post yourself to understand just why. Anyway, zooming in on economics, this graph shows how common a p-value is across a lot of published papers. The higher the data point, the more we see it. And as expected, if economists are p-hacking, we see a big spike right around 0.05. In other words, economists appear to be engaging in some form of p-hacking. The same, by the way, is true for psychologists and also true for biologists. The point is that this behavior exists. But this is an aggregate result. What if I want to know if a single research paper has evidence of p-hacking? For that, we turn to the p-curve. Now, if you actually plan to run a p-curve analysis, please, please read the detailed instructions on the p-curve website as there are some key steps you have to get right. But for now, we're going to stick to the intuition of what the p-curve is doing rather than on the mechanics. In short, the p-curve looks at all the key p-values in a paper and plots the frequency. Since published papers rarely include key results with p-values above 0.05, the analysis only looks at these smaller values. Then it plots all those p-values on what's called a histogram, which basically just shows how frequently each p-value is observed. So if a paper has 10 critical p-values, the graph might look like this, or like this, or like this. What's critical is that there are really only three general shapes that we care about. A flat line, an upward sloping line, and a downward sloping line. And for our purposes, we're actually going to focus only on the upward and downward sloping lines. Let's see what each of those means. If we have a downward sloping line, that means that the researcher reported many more very small p-values as compared to p-values that are just on this side of significant, just below 0.05. And if we see this type of shape, the likelihood of what a researcher is reporting being true is actually quite high. So that otherwise, a line like this suggests little or no p-hacking. And that's because p-hacking occurs at the margins, right around 0.05. If the researcher found lots of statistical results with very tiny p-values, far from the 0.05 value, then the most likely conclusion is that they found very strong evidence for whatever it is that they're studying. But what if the line is upward sloping? 
Well, before we see what an upward sloping line means, if you could take a moment to like this video, subscribe to this channel, and click that little bell icon so that you don't miss out on any new content I put out, I'd really appreciate it. With that said, let's see how p-curves detect p-hacking. So let's say you see a line that looks like this. What this is saying is that there are far more p-values closer to 0.05 than there are really small p-values. And what's important to realize is that if the thing that a researcher is studying is genuinely real, as in it isn't p-hacked, this should not happen. The reason is that when researchers p-hack, they don't try to get their p-values as low as possible, that's hard to do, but rather they try to get it to just below 0.05 so that they can claim statistical significance. And by doing so, they increase the share of these just significant values, resulting in a p-curve like this. So a p-curve lets you detect whether p-hacking was likely to occur or not. Though to be fair, I'm grossly oversimplifying things here. In reality, a p-curve could be flat or even slightly downward sloping in the presence of p-hacking, and the tool itself attempts to make that differentiation, though the details of that are a bit more than we need to get to get the basic intuition. But if you're curious, I'll link to the academic paper on this as well as the tool itself in the discussion below. In short, if you find too many p-values that are just below 0.05, you should be pretty suspicious of whether the researcher p-hacked their results. The p-curve provides us a formal way of doing that, rather than just eyeballing things, and I strongly suggest you try it out the next time you suspect that p-hacking might be going on. Wrapping up this series, what I love about the p-curve is that it is a weapon of sorts to combat bad research practices. It acts as a deterrent for those who are considering p-hacking. If you're a researcher who's incentivized to publish papers to succeed in your career, and you're considering taking a less than ethical shortcut, there is a new tool that might detect your bad behavior. Knowing that, I hope that this hypothetical researcher takes the time to think about just how bad it would be if they were called out with evidence as a p-hacker. With the p-curve, that likelihood is high and the consequences could be very, very real. So just by having this tool, science has improved. People are less likely to act inappropriately if they know that they could get caught. So, bad outcomes in the form of untrue findings are limited. This is a huge win for science. I hope you now understand a bit better how to use a p-curve to detect p-hacking behavior. In other videos in this series, I covered four specific forms of p-hacking. But if there's a form of p-hacking that you want to share with me that I'm not covering, please leave a comment below and I'll make sure to keep the conversation going. Finally, as always, thanks so much for watching.